Here in Devon, in the tranquil Tamar Valley, is a port that once bustled with industry. Overground, farmers supplied Britain's growing towns and cities with fresh produce. Daffodils set for London. While underground, miners extracted copper and precious minerals. Burning! Now at Morwellum Quay, archaeologists Alex Langlands and Peter Ginn and historian Ruth Goodman are going back in time to the early 1900s to live the lives of Edwardian farmers for a full calendar year. They'll not just be farming, but getting to grips with the rural industries that once brought wealth to Devon. Oh, oh wow! We got something! So far, the team have breathed new life into the farm, undertaking high-risk ventures and turning to the latest farming practices of the age. Look! Just down here, we have trout. We have succeeded in our new enterprise. Now it's December on the Edwardian farm. With winter set in and Christmas looming, the team face the challenge of earning a living in one of the hardest months of the year. They need to profit from their livestock. That is never a job I enjoy. <laughs> Leave the farm in search of work. Look! <laughs> a hot tap! Whoa! And head to the coast to reap the ocean's bounty. Oh, Peter, in luck again, mate. Really? We're in luck again. The dawn of the 20th century brought great changes to society. The Industrial Revolution had enticed rural workers away from farms to the cities with the promise of higher wages and a better standard of living. In towns and big houses, people are living a really modern life. And motor cars and piped water and WCs and all the other benefits of the Edwardian age. And yet, out in the countryside, quite large numbers of people were still having to deal with a very much older way of living. With poverty rife in the countryside, Edwardian farmers often had to find work away from their land. In the Tamar Valley, many took advantage of the north and south Devon coasts to profit from the county's other great industry, fishing. Now, there would have almost certainly have been dedicated fishermen at the time who would have spent their whole lives fishing, but there's also that class of people who were kind of fishermen farmers, people who had one foot on the land and one foot in the sea. So um, we're hoping that uh, we can uh, turn our unskilled farm labourers' hands to a bit of uh, fishing and maybe with a few crab and perhaps a lobster, we'll be able to make ourselves a few pennies before Christmas. It wasn't just men who had to look for extra work. In the age that gave rise to the suffragette movement, Ruth is also hoping to earn her own wage away from home. Oh, a bit of sunshine. Excellent. For many women in rural areas, getting to work was made possible by the mass production of an easy mode of transport. got this bicycle. I'm really excited about it because in the Edwardian period they were suddenly available to everybody including really ordinary people. It means that there's a new way of getting about. You can travel much bigger distances. It gives you a real freedom, especially for women. Um, so I'm quite excited about having a go at this Edwardian bicycle and I've got a book to tell me how to ride it. 
we go. It's and a B for bicycle. There we are. Bicycle to ride. Uh, mount the machine from an elevation. And as soon as it is a run a little way, spring yourself on the step and throwing the right leg over on the backbone, drop a little forward into the saddle. And the moment the machine appears to be falling to the left, draw the left hand a little towards you. Have the effect of turning the driving wheel in the same direction, readjusting the balance. Flipping heck, how would you ever learn to ride a bike from instructions like that? <laughs> Some people you know actually made these available as a sort of form of charity so that ordinary people could get jobs, get on your bike and find a job. It really meant something. Here we go. Watch out, mad lady coming through. The bicycle enabled women to become an integral part of a more mobile workforce. Wow, speed, freedom, it's just great. Before Alex can take to the seas to fish for crabs and lobsters, he'll need the right equipment. He's come to meet Cornish fisherman and craftsman, Nigel Legg. Nigel's been making traditional lobster pots for over 40 years. He weaves them using willow, or withies as they're known in the trade. Fishermen have been making lobster pots in this way for over 150 years. Hello Nigel. Hello. Nice to meet you. And you. So this is uh, the lobster basket then? Well, a lobster pot. A lobster pot, yeah. sorry. Yeah, we're um, very, very keen to get out fishing, but we need some traditional lobster pots, as you right. say. When you've come to the right place and um, right time of the year, so we can have a go at making one if you want. Yeah, jolly good. So where are you starting? You're actually starting almost sort of at the top of... You start at the top, you bind the mouth, yep. make the mouth, then everything's sticking up in the air, and then like a, like a big shuttle dock. Yep. And then we pull the withies down yep. and tie them into the stand then you'll get the actual shape of the pot. Ah, uh, right. And then you start off binding and just gradually get bigger and bigger and bigger as you go around. Let's have a look then, well, we'll master at work. Just get, well, I guess not master, but uh, the binding now is getting a little bit small, so I'm just going to add a couple of withies to it. Right, so OK. Just, just cripple the ends like that. Cripple the ends? Yeah, just bend them. Right. Bend them. And you'll trap them under that bar there, so they're in, they're in an underneath now, trapped, so they can't come out. And then just yep. catch a spinold and... OK. Like that. Get a twist, right. always the way with these crafts I get these fantastic windows into the crafts world and I think to myself god I'd I'd love to do that but you know crafts are like this are really you know a life's work well it's a little bit of fun now it's still hard work but years ago it, it certainly was different now it, you had to do it because it was if you didn't make pots you didn't go fishing yeah of course um, and you had the old man there sort of giving you a swipe with a withy occasionally every time you've got it wrong. So it was, uh, um, He's not there now, is he? He's in here now, no. <laughs> right. Once Nigel finishes binding the sidebars, he's ready to weave the bottom of the pot. Just grab a handful like this. Yeah. In underneath there. Right. You can see, see the shape of the pot coming now. Yeah, definitely. You see a lobster in there yet? Not yet. Go put the Put the bottom in there. Right, okay. So the whole thing is woven together in effect. Okay, well, all we're, all we're doing now is going towards the middle. Yeah. Peter and I are quite anxious about this. You know, how, how long are we going to have to sort of spend on the coast, fingers crossed, waiting for that long This time of year, about three and a half months, isn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, if it was fine weather, I wouldn't be surprised to have a catch of four or five crabs and two lobsters. Really? I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised. So we could come good here. We could do, yeah, yeah. I also wouldn't be surprised if we didn't catch anything. Oh, it's closing it all up. Yeah, just tightening it all up. Brilliant. Well, that's your pot. There it is. Down to you now. I, yeah. can't, I can't do no more. <laughs> right, good luck. Well, thanks ever so much for your time, Nigel. That's right, no problem. It's been a real pleasure. 
Alex and Peter's success as fishermen will depend on the coast's unpredictable weather. They've agreed to exchange their labour for a share in the catch with Brixham fisherman Bill Wakeham. Bill has spent his working life at sea, catching crabs and lobsters off the South Devon coast. A fisherman's ability to make a living has always been dictated by tides and winds. Hello there, Bill. Hello, Bill. How are you? All right. Hi. Got a bit of a better morning. Is there yeah. a problem with the weather? Yeah, you've got an old uh, easterly swell here, onshore breeze. Right. And you won't go anywhere today with this, you know, even knowing what you're doing. Right. So th this old... wind would blow us into the shore? Yeah, and smash you up, and the old swell that's in the water ain't going to do you no good at all. So it's it's off for the it's day, a, then? It's an encore. <laughs> that's a real but, shame. Yeah, it is. Put it this way, you're better off a starving fisherman than a dead one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you think this will last for long? Well, I'm hoping not. You know, I can be here for a week, two weeks, three weeks even. What we do then is vice versa. I'm going to look for a job on a farm if it goes on too <laughs> long. Yeah. Can we leave this with you then? And if you get a chance to stick it out in the next few days yeah. or weeks, uh, and then maybe we'll come back and give you a hand hauling them out. Yeah, no trouble at all. Okay. And what you get out of them is yours sort of thing, you know. Perfect. Great stuff. Well, look, hopefully we'll see you in the next couple okay, of weeks. Lads. Okay. Cheers, Take care. That is such a shame. Oh, I know, really it's a big looking, disappointment, isn't it? Really looking forward to it. Listen, we've got beef at home, haven't we? Yeah. We're at the sea. Let's yep. get some oysters. oysters. Oysters and beef, winning combination, always. They're a bit pricey, though, mate, aren't they? Ruth's away. Well, we're supposed to be on a budget. Ruth's away. Like many Edwardian women, Ruth is after part-time work as a domestic servant. She's come to Lanhydrock House, the Edwardian country estate of wealthy politician Lord Robarts and his family. In its heyday, as many as 80 part-time and live-in staff were employed to look after the house. At times of year when they've got special cleaning to do, special preparations to do, it was usual in the Edwardian period for other people to come in and help do a bit of charring or so forth. A bit of extra money. Lanhydrock House was almost destroyed by a devastating fire in 1881. It was rebuilt with a new design that reflected the high morals and the strict Anglican principles of the Robarts family. Gosh, this is quite some house and quite some kitchen. Today, Lan Hydrock is managed by the National Trust, and its curator is Paul Holden. What's this um, book then? This is uh, Robert Kerr's book, A Gentleman's House. And Lanhydrock House was based around this. Um, oh, right. it, it was laid out to achieve high moral planning throughout the house and the segregation of male and female within the staff quarters as well. Uh, it actually says here, and I quote from this, the working rooms of men ought to form one division and those of the women another. Wow, so completely separate. Complete segregation. This family were an extremely high Anglican family and they really didn't want anything going on under their roof that they couldn't explain. And then it goes one stage further again in that leading away from the kitchens you've got a stone staircase for men leading up to their quarters and a wooden staircase for women leading up to their quarters. <laughs> the women's staircase being wood for their slighter frames, that's what Kerr tells us. And where those staircases meet at the top there's a locked door. <laughs> no hanky panky. <laughs> Only the butler would have had the key. <laughs> and it's firmly in my pocket. <laughs> in the early 1900s, over one and a half million Edwardians worked in domestic service. As an industry, it was the country's biggest employer.